So today we're gonna look at doing something slightly different. We've been doing a series on Michel Foucault for a little bit now, and I'm gonna look to continue and finish that, but a little bit later. Right now I wanna deal with a question that got brought up to me, and I wanna give it a shot to try to answer in it, or at least why I personally think that this question is very important to consider. So just the other day I was asked the question, how is Heidegger's philosophy implicated in his Nazism? Now, I'm the kind of thinker that thinks that in some imminent way, there's an implication between Heidegger's philosophy and Nazi ideology. And there's a few ways of arriving to this. I'm just gonna put forward that mm, what I think, in short, is that Heidegger is a neoclassical, sad, nostalgia boy, and that informs his sense of origin and destiny in some apoliticized or depoliticized theoretical ground which ultimately amounted to a fucked up political practice. I personally have a few ways of addressing this imminently from Heidegger's own philosophy, which means that in turn we have to understand Heidegger himself. But besides just Heidegger himself, I also want to include a psychoanalytic criticism of Heidegger, just as a way of essentially elaborating on how I made my way out of Heidegger too. There's plenty of commentary already on Heidegger, and I'm gonna put a few links down below in the sidebar just to have other people that will flesh out other aspects of Heidegger that I may not touch upon. So I'm going to be working with the assumption that so some people know a little bit of Heidegger, but I'm still going to explain what I think is needed in order to make this case. So for one, we can consider the question of ontological difference as articulated in the heidegger Carnap debate when we ask the fundamental question of what is being and the end of metaphysics, Heidegger points out our predisposition to rendering being as technical determinate entities, as in the case of instrumental and utilitarian reason, in the case of, let's say, uh, scientific practice and what Heidegger calls enframing as a way of creating a frame through which the only entities that really are counted for are uh, already the entities understood in these technical terms. If we consider the philosophy of Rudolf Carnap, for example, this approach to philosophy highlights the use of logic as a way to reduce and purify philosophy from traditional metaphysical spe speculation. Carnap was essentially trying to create a form of measure by which philosophy is becoming more like a science that went to inform a lot of the logical positivist movement. But Heidegger would see Carnap as turning philosophy in fact into a science and consequentially missing another aspect of philosophy. The key difference to Heidegger from Carnap is that he, much like, let's say, the Frankfurt School thinkers, finds Carnap and the logical positivists, as well as what would eventually become analytic philosophy, to be a return to the same of dogmatic metaphysics. Something would be on question still in the approach that they had, that they still maintain a sort of dogmatism over taking something for granted in philosophy, in this case, let's say, the status of language and the kind of categorical distinctions that have been built in, into language as a way of uh, creating a form of metaphysics, a way of conceiving of entities being and beings as they relate to one another. For Heidegger, Carnap only restated, again, a dogmatic metaphysical thought without radically dislocating the question of what being is as fundamental. So, in looking at the original and primordial question of being, Heidegger distinguishes between fundamental and regional ontology. Fundamental ontology would be that concerned with being as such, whereas regional ontology addresses the ontic, or the determinate entities. So the problem with Carnap, again, is that his approach remains regional rather than foundational. And in attempting to revive the question of being in this fundamental sense, Heidegger points out that the question has been historically obscured. Again, Heidegger is our very good old nostalgia boy, kind of a sad boy too, and he attempts to reconstruct the missing meaning of being. In other words, this is why Heidegger is talked about as a thinker that could belong with Plato and Aristotle. That is also why Heidegger uses language in such an unconventional way, as a way of breaking out of the way in which we are used to habituating language, 
to point out what is it that we have obscured in this, these habits. In doing this, Heidegger tries to revive the pre-Platonic understanding of the question of being as more poetic rather than technical. As in the understanding of the question in, let's say, the terms of Greek myth and religion. These poetics are often the source of uh, Heideggerian forms of mysticism and the Heideggerian phenomenological theological term. Here is, at least for one, one of the major issues I take with Heidegger and what, why I find that this is symptomatic of something else. I find that Heidegger is mistaken in claiming that poetics are more fundamental than science. In other words, I think Heidegger re regionalizes the fundamental question of being and tries to tame the gap between poesis and techne, again this question of the poetic and the technical, in taming the question of ontological difference altogether. And here is where I would like to include a Lacanian joke pertaining sexual difference. Heidegger wants there to be a whole woman. He's no better than the masculine fantasy that tries to put on a band-aid over the inconsistencies that make woman as an imaginary, ideal, and fantastical sense not whole. In a Lacanian pun, Wom the same way that woman is a symptom of man, poesis are the symptom of Heidegger and his Nazism. On a, the more philosophical point, however, I don't think that Heidegger successfully accounted for the fundamental question of being. He only stumbled into another regional ontology. On the more implicative psychoanalytic non-philosophical sense of this question, Heidegger's poetics are much of what informed his conservatism and his sense of righteous mysticism, whereby truth, or aletheia, is the revelation of another region of being, an opening, so to speak. But I want to note that this definition, this approach to the question, prioritizes and regionalizes the question of being, or the being of truth, already into poetics. For instance, let us consider his figure of the shepherd of being, whereby the task, the task of thinking is not quite poesis or techne. In fact, Heidegger goes on to mention that uh, this poetic or technical approach are just modes of thinking, that thinking takes on in letting foundational being be as it is rendered into determinate and regional entities. Nevertheless, the poetic figure of the shepherd of being works as a device which demonstrates that the poetic mode of revealing shows another possibility for language, thought, origin, and destiny, as well as the destiny of the humanity who dwells in this language, in this question. The question of origin and destiny are particularly problematics that reflect these symptoms of Heidegger's Nazism. The question of origin, for instance, we must be reminded that Heidegger is another neoclassical nostalgia boy like Nietzsche or Wagner, and this is what informs Heidegger's sense of alienation from origin. We can, in a sense, think of ancient Greece as nothing but a void for the projective neoclassical fantasies in Germany at the time that constitute and corroborate contemporary desires. In essence, ancient Greece is nothing but what we want there to be at a certain time. When one is grasping uh, one's own most possibility of being, in the sense of being authentic in the Heideggerian sense, one can almost put authenticity everywhere. I actually find that Heidegger's jargon of authenticity and inauthenticity, which often tends to be taken as the way in which Heidegger can be emancipatory, I find, find that this is all part of what falls into complicity with Nazism, especially when we ask what it means to be authentic for Heidegger. In psychoanalytic terms, he's trying to appease a certain hysteria of modernity, this sense of alienation from origin, by alleviating a split subject, as it is reflected in the dispute concerning ontological difference. Sure, Heidegger tries to maintain the open as a way of considering this type of difference, but he consistently falls into a default perspective that closes up and returns to metaphysics, this time in the case of the poetic. Especially today, when authenticity is sold in stores and media, you could say that authenticity is quite compatible with dogmatisms, especially those of an ideological type. 
Heidegger, as, as the Derridean criticism runs, was only concerned with an authenticity that was quite nationalized. For instance, his understanding of the essence of language is highly tied to origin and destiny and belonging to them. An authentic linguistic engagement would be one that remains faithful to the motherland, to having a sense of belonging. So when we consider this figure of ancient Greece as nothing but a void for projecting fantasies, we may linger on this nothing but, especially when we may take under consideration the repetitive compulsion of nostalgia and revival at heart here. For if ancient Greece is nothing, ultimately the repetitions in nostalgia and revival struggle with appeasing this nothing. In other words, if we may take on the common issue in Heidegger and Nietzsche, the return to origin is to restore uh, the question of meaning and engaging with things in meaningful terms. Thus, what is centrally at stake is meaning, and this nothing but highlights a gap and lack becoming apparent in the question of meaning. For instance, let's suppose that we take the notion of cultural decadence a la Sargon of Akkad seriously. His response to such a decadence and degradation of culture, as he pertains to the structure of meaning, is to double down on an eroding meaning by returning to, at best, an idea of its origin. In other words, the seeming response to securing meaning is by supporting the structure that maintains it as meaningful. However, this is not enough if the structuring of meaning itself is structured around a gap that it hovers over. Even if Sargon of Akkad, let's say, is trying to grant, again, the foundation of meaning, that the structural foundation itself is void. For the moment he tries to envision ancient Greece, he's always already missed it, as if there were no ancient Greece, but only fantasies of it. Yeah, sure, ancient Greece was straight. One cannot just close the gap at the core of meaning. At best, one can only patch it over, with some quick fix of fantasy as if it were a band-aid. So if we wanna return to Heidegger as opposed to our outright white supremacist YouTuber, this means retrieving a glorified and mystified sense of origin and destiny which very well blends with Heidegger's fetishizations of rural life as well as of national identity. For instance, in that retrieving meaning as both origin and destiny is also oftentimes a nationalized activity for Heidegger. Here Derrida criticizes Heidegger's sense of retrieving as exclusionary based on who belongs in what language and what survives of a people in a language. The shepherd of being may as well be the border patrol officer of being. Or we can take the more obscene figure of Heidegger taking Husserl's chair of philosophy and driving him to exile from outside Germany. Or we can also consider Heidegger's petitizations of Hannah Arendt's Judaism, reportedly calling her his little Jewess. This is reflective of the obscene, obscure meaning of Heidegger's shepherd of being. The excesses of being as a question are something that reflect Heidegger's own awkward regulation of being as well as his own admitted return to the same of metaphysics slash ideology. Except now, this metaphysics ideology has been deemed glorified as a resurrection of some fetishized dignity, some obscure meaning in the past, because again, Heidegger's a nostalgia boy. In a sense, Heidegger's apolitical attitude in most of his work amount to a mystification of his own always already implicated political commitments, washing his hands of all implication. It is no wonder that Slavoj Žižek refers to the house of being as a torture house. And I may recommend a more thorough critique of Heidegger by Žižek that can be found in his book The Ticklish Subject. Heidegger demands that his fetishized object of desire fit the picture wholly, without a stain. This is in such a way that with each regional ontology that Heidegger would venture through by a fundamental decision in the question of being, he would carry around the name of the nation or the homeland, despite claiming to have overcome such restraints. This demand in Heidegger's philosophy restricts upon him the way that he articulates a split subject of ontological difference, as well as how he is able to captivate, if at all, the object cause of desire constantly implicating his own philosophy. 
for dog Harger recognizes the lack in the other, in this case being as a fundamental question, he seeks to fulfill this gap very inquisitively. The mysticism and theophilosophy at hand in Heidegger's philosophy can be deeply criticized as being in line with mystical practices and processions that circulated in Nazi German ideology at the time. And it has not quite stopped there, for even in the Levinasian turn of phenomenology that sought to overcome these non-ethical uh, aspects of Heidegger, we find that phenomenology has landed in another theological form and that it takes on a new figure of faith. One may continue to ask, as philosopher Tom Sparrow does in his book The End of Phenomenology, what this phenomenological and philosophical faith is at the expense of. Or as Quentin Meyasu and Ellen Badiou ask, is it possible for phenomenology to overcome the Kantian deadlock of correlationism? That we can only think philosophy the same way that phenomenology goes about itself, in a merely relative approach that only returns to the same. Can we think something irrelative, something indifferent to that? In other words, can phenomenology truly engage with the radical other without constantly coming back to itself? And my argument is that Heidegger thought he did so, but he was so hung up on some little difference that he made that he implicated himself in genocidal activities over it. That being said, Heidegger's analysis, for example, let's say, the question concerning technology, has gone to, on to influence a lot of perspectives in a lot of critical thought, like deep ecology or critical theory. For example, a former student of Heidegger and Frankfurt School thinker, Herbert Marcuse, whose text One Dimensional Man emphasizes the relationship between technological and technical thinking, or what we may call instrumental reason, and I said that that has gone on to shape modern society in the industrial age. Marcuse tied this information of how we address the world in instrumental terms onto the development of industrialism and modern capitalism. He has also noted to address his disappointment in at Heidegger in his text Heideggerian Marxism, where he tried to see how Heidegger, the Heideggerian approach could be tied onto an account of class conflict and conflictual models of society. Ultimately, to Marcuse, Heidegger does not hold up to the task, and he ultimately disbowed his teacher as most of the Frankfurt School had to make their way to the United States. In this respect, the critique of modern society and the development of critical theory continued con to consider the question of instrumental reason, as is the case with Theodore Adorno and Max Horheimer, with their text Dialectic of the Enlightenment, where they continue this task, but in a more broader critique of Enlightenment reason as a constant framing the bias of modern life. Though these folks have also been criticized for remaining idealists and thereby rendering their emancipatory project, or the emancipatory aspect of critical theory, somewhat obsolete. These devices and critical approaches continue to be passed on, as in the case of, let's say, Adorno's student, Angela Davis, a member of the Black Panthers and a well-known Marxist feminist sociologist. And she engaged with the question of technologies of racialization, economic stratification, and sexuation in the United States, as in the case of, let's say, her book, Women, Race, and Class, or her direct critique of the prison industrial complex in Our Prisons Obsolete. So, to wrap up, I'm not saying don't read Heidegger. I have perhaps a bit too much. But what I'm trying to say is that there's a certain way in which his thought is implicated as practice, or as a thought practice, so to speak, an event or an act as people like Elaine Badiou and Slavoj Žižek would highlight respectively. We can't just pretend that Heidegger's thought is without a situation, without conditions that brought it about and consequences that were carried out from it. We have to, in this respect, see what is it that might have enabled Heidegger to think in this way and to pat himself in the, on the back over it. The question for me is how is it that Heidegger's thought is not just about a question of application but implication. And that's the highlight of the psychoanalytic critique of Heidegger at play. That in some way or another Heidegger was implicated in his thought. It's very hard to detach Heidegger's own approach to philosophy from him, especially when he very explicitly tried to live in accordance to the thought that he was producing. 
what I'm trying to highlight, if anything, is a foundational blind spot to Heidegger's picture of the question of being, and how that blind spot, even if Heidegger's trying to approach the question of being wholly open, that blind spot continues to close it down. It continues to put a stain on the picture of being, as it reflects these excesses to the question that Heidegger tried to regulate. I think my last comment to be said about Heidegger is that the exclusive emancipatory potential to the poetic has run really dry, and the tendencies to criticize science are reaching an impasse in the face of other philosophers too, like Hélène Badieu, or, fundamentally speaking, Quentin Megasu. I'm more in line with someone like Badieu, who doesn't reduce the question of ontological re difference just to the technical scientific uh, way of thinking and the poetic. As Badieu also includes other things like politics and love as non-philosophical conditions in philosophy. And perhaps it's this detachment from thinking politics as a condition of philosophy that is part of what set up a blind spot for Heidegger's thought in this respect. And how is it that someone like Badieu is able to account for that a little bit better? So, again reiterating, don't stop reading Heidegger, but it's important to be critical of Heidegger, especially because I don't think Heidegger and phenomenology hold up the same way they did, let's say, 20 years ago. <laughs> It's the landscape of philosophy is changing really fast and with that it comes the question of how is it that phenomenology and especially the Heideggerian type of phenomenology holds up today.